to be here to represent class four. The story I'm going to tell you today is about evolutionary origins and about paradigm shifts in our understanding of our genome. It's also a personal story. As you'll see, it's a story about the puzzles and conundrums and discoveries that have uh, helped shape my career. And this story begins, I guess many places, but it begins in 1976 with a remarkable discovery made by Hazumi and Tanigawa. And they were studying the chromosomes of B cells, which are crucial cells of our immune system that produce antibodies. And they provided the first evidence that our antibody genes are really weird. They're really unusual in that we inherit them from our parents in a completely disassembled, non-functional state. These antibody genes start off as clusters of V gene segments, D gene segments, and J gene segments. And as B cells develop, these genes have to be assembled in an irreversible rearrangement or recombination process that joins one of these D segments chosen at random to a J segment also chosen at random. And then the one of the V segments is chosen to be joined to that DJ. And only then, which are the chromosomes being rearranged and messed with, right? Only then do you have a functional antibody gene that can make an antibody protein. And the implications of this were profound. The genome is not static. It's a dynamic entity. It's, in essence, nature's playground. It can undergo alterations, and not just sort of slowly over evolutionary time, but it can undergo dramatic, deliberate changes in individual cells of our body. So this process is known as VDJ recombination for obvious reasons. And uh, you, the, I mean, the first thing you might wonder is, why bother? I mean, why go to all this trouble messing with your chromosome? And the answer is diversity. Because there are a whole bunch of individual distinct V, D, and J gene segments that can be put together in any combination, and because of the actual details of how they're put together, this reaction is capable of generating billions of different antibodies. And the antibodies and the B cells that produce them are a fundamental component of our adaptive immune system. And that's the part of the immune system that's one of the two fundamental branches of our immune system. And that's the part of the immune system that provides critical protection against essentially whatever pathogen nature throws at us. So this is a really important process. So this is about what we understood in the early 1980s. We knew that this reaction was taking place. We had no idea how it happened. We presumed that there must be some sort of molecular scissors that came along and cut the DNA at the V and the D and the J. We had no idea of the identity of that scissors. And this was the sort of situation when I started graduate school in 1984 at MIT. I took my first immunology course. I had no idea about VDJ recombination. I encountered that for the first time. And I was just sort of blown away. I, I thought this was just incredible. The implications for the flexibility of our genome. And so I, I just, I, that's what I wanted to work on. I was really fortunate to join David Baltimore's lab. And he had created an incredible environment. It was a very fertile environment for discovery, for innovation, and for risk taking. And so I decided I'd go after and try to find the, the gene or the proteins or whatever it was, to try to find that molecular scissors. So I devised an approach, and I spent a couple years developing this approach. And to be perfectly honest, almost everybody, including most of the members of my own lab, thought it was absolutely doomed to failure. But th the fact of the matter was a little perseverance, a little bit of sweat. Uh, the initial results looked pretty encouraging. And things seemed to be pointing in the right direction. And at that point, I was very fortunate to be joined in the work by another graduate student in the lab, Margie Ottinger. And over the next three years, Margie and I worked very closely together. And we did indeed find that molecular scissors. And when we did, we were in for a big surprise. It wasn't one gene, as we had sort of expected. It was two genes. And they were called RAG1 and RAG2 for the recombination activating genes. And they had a couple of fascinating properties. The one that we were most grateful for was that they were located right next to each other in the mouse and human chromosomes. And in fact, 
They're located right next to each other in all of the chromosomes of jawed vertebrates. That's everything from sharks all the way through to humans. And if they hadn't been located right next to each other, the approach that I had devised to find them would never have worked. So it turns out that each of them is essential for VDJ recombination, and there are humans that have mutations in RAG1 or RAG2, and those folks have a very unfortunate phenotype. Without either one of these genes, you have no VDJ recombination, you have no B cells, you have no antibody, and you have no adaptive immune system. And that means that you are severely immunodeficient. So this is a really important reaction, and these are really important genes. So if I told you RAG1 and RAG2 are the molecular scissors, they come together, they're each individual, very distinct, different proteins that come, form a complex that we call RAG. And that complex goes and then binds to the DNA. Remember, this is your chromosome, right? And it's going to bind to your, your, the DNA, but it doesn't bind to the V's and the D's and the J's. What it binds to is this little sort of uh, conserved sequence motif that's next to the V and the D and the J called a recombination signal. That's how they know where to bind in the chromosome. And after they bind, they cut the DNA and they generate products that look like this. Okay, now RAG is pretty much done. It's done its job, the molecular scissors has acted, and it turns the reaction over to DNA repair factors that then stick the ends back together again. The V's and the D's and the J's are put together in the chromosome to make the antibody gene, and the recombination signals are joined and cavalierly on a circle that's just tossed out of the chromosome and eventually lost from the cell. So that's VDJ recombination. This is the question that we've been thinking about for 30, 40 years now. Where did this really weird system come from? What are its evolutionary origins? So we've got these totally weird, almost unprecedented genes that are non-functional when you get them from your parents. And we've got these RAG1 and RAG2 genes sitting right next to one another. And I assure you, the reason they're sitting right next to each other is not so that some adventurous graduate student could identify them, right? That wasn't why. So why is this? A key, a key uh, a piece of evidence that, that told us probably what was going on came in 1998, published simultaneously from my lab and Marty Gellert's lab. And it turns out that RAG isn't just a molecular scissors. It's also a jumping gene machine. So what RAG can do, as I told you, come along, bind the DNA, cut the DNA. But what we discovered is that when they cut the DNA, they don't let go of the ends. They hold on to those recombination signals tightly. And then they can do something quite remarkable. If another piece of DNA comes wandering by, let's the, we'll call it the target DNA, RAG can take that excised fragment of DNA and insert it into the target, boom. And you'll see the consequence of this is that the piece of DNA has been cut out of one context and jumped into another. That is a classic example of a reaction known as transposition. And transposons are the professionals that are doing this. They exist in virtually all genomes that we know of. And this connection between RAG and transposition had really provocative implications, and it led to a new theory for how the the whole system of VDJ recombination evolved and where our adaptive immune system came from. And it was known as the RAG transposon model for this entity that was called the RAG transposon. And as you can see, what it contains is it was postulated to contain a gene that sort of resembled RAG1, a gene that sort of resembled RAG2, and it was flanked by sequences that kind of resembled that recombination signal. And the theory proposes that about 450 million years ago, just as the early vertebrates were starting to evolve and some, some sort of sharky-like creature swimming around in the sea, this transposon did a, a jumping event, a transposition event, but it wasn't just into any old sort of random target DNA. It was an almost miraculous event that jumped into a gene, and not just any gene, it was an antibody-like gene. And when it jumped into that gene, it created the first, the very first ancestral, the primordial antibody gene. And all antibody genes have then come from that one. And in parallel, this, these genes up here that were RAG-like, that were a jumping gene machine, 
evolved to become the RAG1 and RAG2 molecular scissors. So this theory was great. It seemed, it explained the origin of the genes. It explained why RAG1 and RAG2 were right next to each other, because they were right next to each other in this, this, this jumping element up here. But there was one thing that it, it, it sort of was missing when it was first proposed, was that this thing here was just completely hypothetical. We didn't, we didn't know whether it existed or not. But could we find evidence for that? So the answer was, thank goodness, more and more and more genomes have been sequenced, and it's turned out that elements that look just like this have been found in all sorts of weird organisms now. A whole bunch of invertebrates, the most evolutionary distant from us is the sea urchin. So this strongly suggested that the RAG transposon model was correct, and I think it's widely accepted in the field now. But if that's true, something pretty miraculous happened. A gene or an entity whose whole mission in life was to jump around thinking only of itself, a sort of selfish mobile element, had to evolve into a tamed VDJ recombinase. And to understand why that's so important, think about the consequences of having a rogue transposon uh, running amok in your genome. Okay, So I've told you that after RAG cuts the DNA, it remains tightly bound to those ends. And it can do one of two things. It can do the nice, safe thing. It can, tr it can allow recombination to occur, making the antibodies, getting rid of the circular piece of DNA, great. Or it can transpose. And really, the only thing it can transpose into is one of our chromosomes. And when it does that, it disrupts chromosome integrity. It can disrupt the function of nearby genes. And in the worst case scenario, it can cause cancer. So I've told you that the ancient RAG transposon did this. And I've told you that RAG1 and RAG2 are capable of doing this. But it turns out that RAG1 and RAG2 will only do this in the test tube. If we take the purified proteins, mix them with DNA, they can do this. But in living cells, in the mouse or the human or any other species that's been looked at, you never see this happen. You only see recombination. So something happened. An element that did this professionally as its entire lifestyle evolved to become something that would only do this. How did that happen? And I tell you, I've been, I've been puzzling over this question for 20 years, ever since we discovered that RAG could transpose, we, and we've not been able to figure it out. And the answer came from a pretty unexpected direction, which was one of these RAG transposon-like elements from a weirdo species called Amphioxus. This element is called proto-RAG. It uh, was discovered by Anlang Zhu's group, and we've been collaborating with Anlang's lab ever since. They, they identified it a few years ago. And the, the, the transposable element has all the hallmarks that we expected. It has a RAG1-like gene called proto-RAG1, a proto-RAG2-like, a proto-RAG2 gene. It was flanked by these sequences that looked kind of like recombination signals. It was exactly what we wanted. And this has been a joy to work with. These pro we've been able to express the proteins. We've been able to work with them in the test tube. They bind DNA. They cut DNA very much like RAG. That's been uh, fantastic. But we were more interested in their differences than in their similarities. And there was something that proto-RAG could do that RAG couldn't do. And that was to be able to transpose in living cells. And this shows you our typical transposition assay. This is being done in, in human cells. And you can see the proto-RAG is nicely active. RAG is the big Zippo. And the question is, why? Why is this guy able to transpose and this guy isn't? Well, it turns out that the answer, we were fortunate to make the guess that, that if we could just get some structural information, molecular structures of proto-RAG, maybe we could figure this out. And so we turned to cryo-electron microscopy to determine the structure, and the key players here were a fabulous postdoc in my lab, Yu Hang Zhang, and Tat Cheng, who was then a postdoc in Yong Zhang's lab at Yale. And the three of them working together did, in fact, determine the molecular structure of the proto-RAG protein. And it's shown here bound the two molecules of DNA in orange and red. You can see them running through the heart of the protein complex, 
the Proto-RAG-1 subunits. There's two of them in purple and light blue, and two subunits of Proto-RAG-2. The structure was beautiful. It was elegant. It had all sorts of wonderful, de rich details in it, one of which was that it was incredibly similar to the structure of RAG-1 and RAG-2. And that's pretty amazing because these enzymes have been diff diverging from one another for 700 million years, and yet they still have strong structural similarity. But we were actually less interested in their similarities than in their differences. So how does this differ from RAG? Well, I, this is where I totally give the credit to Yu Hong. He spent a ton of time staring at this structure, trying to find something that would jump out at him. And suddenly, one particular amino acid caught his eye deep in the heart of the proto-RAG1 protein amino acid number 949. So why 949? Well, what Yu Hong noted was that 949 is here in proto-RAG, and it's actually an arginine in RAG1. They're chemically extremely different amino acids. They're lying at a very provocative place in the protein, very close to the part of the protein that actually cuts the DNA, what we call the active site. So to have this major chemical difference so close to the active site was provocative. But then Yu Hong noted that in all of the jawed vertebrates, this is an arginine, and in all of the invertebrates, it's a methionine. So that was really suggestive. So Yu Hong did a very simple experiment. He just changed the arginine in RAG1 to a methionine and repeated the assay for transposition. And here's the data that I've already shown you. Proto-RAG1 is, proto is active, RAG is dead. And then here is the mutant. And for the first time, we could reproducibly detect transposition inside human cells. We were excited, but we were kind of disappointed, too, because, again, you don't need to be a member of the National Academy to see that this little green guy here is not quite as tall as this guy here. In fact, it was a hundredfold less active than proto-rag. OK, so we're missing something, right? What are we missing? So we couldn't figure it out. We thought about it, we thought about it. And then we said, well, what about RAG2? Because we're always using RAG2 in these experiments. And we turned out that we were using a form of RAG2 that extended out and included what we called the negative noodle. We call it the negative noodle because it's negatively charged. It's predicted to be floppy. And so I said, well, let's just try taking off the negative noodle. And boom. Now, if you combine this truncated form of RAG2 with the mutant form of RAG1, transposition was now equal to that of proto-RAG. And lest you think it's all due to RAG2, the RAG, if you use this truncated form of RAG2 with normal RAG1, again, the activity is zero. So what these data showed us was that the arginine in 848 and the RAG2 negative noodle each potently suppress transposition. That is, evolution has endowed us with a dual-layered protective mechanism. It is, in essence, a fail-safe to make absolutely sure that transposition doesn't happen. And if you reverse both of those protective mechanisms, basically taking RAG back about 400 million years in evolution, you can have a 1,000-fold increase in the transposition efficiency. So the story I've told you today is a story of the history of our, of our adaptive immune system. In a sense, our adaptive immune system owes its very existence, at least in its current form, to a selfish DNA element that did a miraculous transposition event to create a key component of our adaptive immune system and also then allowed itself to be domesticated by these changes here and here to become the molecular scissors of VDJ recombination. And these two entities here and here have co-evolved with one another to be passed down into all of the jawed vertebrates that now exist, as far as we know, on the planet. So I've tried to acknowledge the people that did the work along the way. Let me just now say a huge thank you to all the people that have worked in my lab over the last 28 years. I'm incredibly grateful to them for their ingenuity, their creativity, their hard work, and their friendship. And I would be happy to take questions.